Welcome back, everybody. Today, we have the full season breakdown of Michigan basketball 2020 and 2021. A year some didn't even think would occur after COVID shut down college basketball for the entirety of March Madness in 2020. And there were still questions as we got to the preseason and even to the start of the season how COVID would affect this year in college basketball. We made it through. Congratulations to the Baylor Bears who won the national title last season. They were deserving of that uh, that honor. I predicted that honor for them. Uh, they were the best team in college basketball this season. But let's go back to Michigan. Michigan coming into the year was just on the precipice of the top 25. No more and certainly no more. Uh, no one saw this team as a contender. That's for sure. Um, I didn't even see this team as much. We had lost the two cornerstones of the team, Xavier Simpson and John Teske, to graduation. Both of them are doing well in the G League, by the way. Uh, and we're returning a still a solid group of guys, but nothing I thought was spectacular by any stretch of the imagination. I thought this team was around a 6th or 7th seed in the NCAA tournament, which is perfectly acceptable, um, but definitely nothing special. However, we got underway playing a bunch of M- M- MAC teams, MAC, the Midwest Athletic Conference, I think. Um, and as you can see, Michigan had a really decent start to the year. Uh, not amazing, though, because the wins over Bowling Green, uh, which was a 14-pointer, in Oakland especially, which was an overtime game, were not resounding by any stretch of the imagination, especially compared to the other top teams. Like, Illinois was killing teams uh, like by 60 points. Gonzaga was slaughtering talented teams. Uh, so Michigan started the year wasn't amazing. Uh, and then another 19-point win over Ball State, 84-65. Uh, the first signs of life I saw from this team were against UCF. Uh, UCF, not their peak this year. They were not at their peak. But they were a good enough team um, to beat Houston um, and to do some damage uh, in the American Conference. They were not amazing, but they were a decent quality opponent. And Michigan dealt with them extremely easily. This was also a game where I noticed Hunter Dickinson really for the first time as a potential All-American type player. He had played in the previous three games, um, but... This was the game where Austin Davis went down with plantar fasciitis and Hunter Dickinson took the reins of the offense pretty much uh, from inside. He could score at will. He was an amazing passer, and he was just just veteran-like play for a freshman out of DeMath Catholic. But I'll talk about him later. Um, As Michigan continued into the season, a 20-point win over a Toledo team that ended up being the best team in the MAC, I think, even though... It ended up not being them who made the tournament. Um, I can't even remember which Missouri. Oh, um, oh, I cannot remember which Missouri. Oh, Ohio, of course, with Jason Preston. Uh, that was the MAC team that made the tournament. But Toledo, by most metrics, was the best team in the MAC, and Michigan dealt with them very easily. Another theme here, Michigan put up 80-plus points in all five of these games, so the offense was humming. Then we got to Penn State. Isaiah Washington... Um, Isaiah Brockington, excuse me, and company put the scare into this Michigan team in a game that was down to the wire, in a game that we were lucky to come out of with the win. This was, of course, in Penn- in Pennsylvania, uh, but nonetheless, I was concerned by this performance from Michigan. Shots weren't falling. However, we found a way to win, and I was proud of that. Still, at this point, though, although we were 6-0, and I wasn't too sure where this team where this team stood in terms of the national picture in terms of even the Big Ten picture. An 80 to 69 win over Nebraska on Christmas Day after a 12 game 12 day layoff because Michigan's game against North Carolina State uh, in the ACC turn in the ACC Big Ten Challenge was postponed because North Carolina State had COVID issues. The next game Michigan played was on Christmas Day against Nebraska. I'll remember Teddy Allen going off in this one. He had like 23 points in the first half. He later transferred out of Nebraska, but he he put up a big game in this one. And this game was close at the half. Nebraska was hitting a lot of shots. 
They were playing well above their potential, or well up, well to the peak of their potential, I'd say. And Michigan was playing down to their level slightly. But Michigan pulled away in the second half, led by smooth shooting from Isaiah Livers, led by a good game from, Is- from uh, Hunter Dickinson, and led by Franz Wagner. They pulled away, and they ended up taking an 11-point win in a game that wasn't as stressful as I thought it could be. Um, and then moving on to New Year's Day, or New Year's Eve, Hunter Dickinson with a revenge game against Maryland, putting up 26 points, 11 rebounds against his home state team, getting really fired up after a couple of dunks, staring at Mark Turgeon, the coach who didn't want him as much as Juwan did. Uh, and this was after this game, I made a video, my first ever video on the channel alone. I said Hunter Dickinson was a Wooden Award candidate, and I said he was a, should have been an All-American at the time. This was the peak of Hunter Dickinson's season, I'd say. It's not like he fell off. He didn't fall off, but this was the peak of his season. Northwestern Michigan, uh, uh, that's not true. It wasn't the peak of his season. It was the peak of his hype. His season improved in other ways after this game. Now, th- January 3rd, uh, I'd driven down to Florida here, uh, and so we were watching on an iPad because Florida did not get the Big Ten Network. Uh, our house in Florida did not. So I was watching for an iPad. At the time, Northwestern's actually ranked 19th in the country, and Michigan was 16th in the country. Michigan was still undefeated, 8-0, and and this was a blowout. Um, Michigan shut down Pete Nance, who had had a really good stretch. Uh, they shut down Miller Cop. They completely destroyed Boo Booey, who went through a slump around this time that de- de- derailed Northwestern's chances at the NCAA tournament. But at the time, Northwestern was 3-0 in the Big Ten, uh, tied with Michigan for first in the Big Ten. And they looked like a threat to do damage in the NCAA tournament. Michigan put an end to that. They were up by 29 points in this game and ended up with a comfortable 19-point victory uh, that really was closer. The final score was closer um, than the actual game was. So we move on to Minnesota here. And Minnesota, at the time we played them, was also in the top 25. Richard Bettino was still their coach. Uh, He wasn't... He wasn't in the hot seat at the moment because Minnesota was playing really well under Marcus Carr, under Gabe Kalsher, under Liam Robbins, the Drake transfer. Michigan came. Michigan didn't come. Minnesota came to Ann Arbor this January 6th game. Michigan laid the boom, uh, going up by as much as 30 points in this one. Hunter Dickinson didn't have his biggest game. He had a really big game, actually. What am I saying? Hunter Dickinson had quite the game here uh, with around 20 points, uh, if I remember correctly. Franz Wagner had a great game here. Mike Smith played well. Eli Brooks played well. The whole team did damage against Minnesota here. And then six days later on a week night game on ESPN, a Sonic blockbuster, Michigan at this point was now seventh in the country. Uh, and Wisconsin was ninth in the country, so it was a top 10 matchup. I remember this game because I was really nervous that this would be Michigan's first loss. At this time, I still thought Nate Rivers and Micah Potter were going to be a lot for Hunter to handle. I was very wrong. I should have known. Liam Robbins had been the national player the week the, the week before, and Hunter had controlled him. But Hunter dominated those two guys, and Michigan's defense was just just astounding. Uh, Michigan ended up going on a 43-6 and run in this game and blowing the doors off of a Wisconsin team that ended up not being as good as their ranking in this game indicated. However, no, take nothing away from Michigan. They're up 40 at one point, and only because Juwan put in the bench mob did this game come down to a 23-point final margin. It was a blowout. It was a massive blowout. I was so I was I was talking so much after this game. I really believe Michigan was. I mean, had this was like one of the best starts I could remember. We were 11 and 0, and of course we went that weekend to Minnesota and got our butts handed to us. Um, it was a rough game all around. Shooting just wasn't happening. Um, Shawnee Brown was the only positive note on this one. He had 14 points. The rest of the team just was completely stymied. Liam Robbins ended up with like 27 or something. And this was basically Minnesota's final final hurrah um, in this season. They, they ended up moving up to 16th in the rankings after this one, only to lose eight of their final 10 games and completely miss the NCAA tournament in a shocking end to the season. Um, but this loss, Michigan State at seventh in the country after this one because of the Wisconsin game earlier. But this loss was definitely humbling and 
cooled down a lot of the talk about this team being a potential national title contender. The Maryland game, huge bounce back win three days later. Maryland had bounced back from a really rough start to the year and had looked like a better team, like a more Mark Turgeon-esque team. But Michigan did what it needed to do, won this game by 24, never in doubt the entire time. And this was really impressive to me. It proved to me that this Michigan team had the brains but also had the brawn and the strength to fight back from a tough loss and demoralize a really good team. Next game was against Purdue, uh, who ended up being a four-seed in the NCAA tournament, but at this time they were still underrated. Uh, I knew Purdue would be a, more of a challenge than people were thinking about at the time. Uh, they had four solid freshmen led by Jaden Ivey and, of course, Trevion Williams at the center position. But Michigan basically just limited Purdue's offense on this day, January 22nd, remember that date, because after this one, which was a 17-point win for Michigan, pretty stress-free, COVID struck the program, and this was this was a, the first turning point in the season. Um, it wasn't, it didn't signal any downfall, especially after Michigan came back and played well. But it definitely stifled some momentum that had been building the rest of the entire year. Uh, and Michigan had been playing so well, with one exception. This was a tough break because Michigan also missed four opportunities for games that were against lower tier Big Ten programs that would just given hopefully given them some easy wins. But alas. The B117 variant struck Michigan, not the athletic program, but it struck the university. All play was halted from January 22nd to February 14th, and Michigan had to wait it out with no practice, just some hard quarantining. But we got back, took on Wisconsin. We were down in the first half, um, put down big in the first half by 14 points, but held Wisconsin to 20 points in the second half. We put up 40 in the second half and ended up winning by eight in a game that I really thought Michigan was going to lose. This was a really big game for me. I, I made a video right after it saying that it proved to me that Michigan's mental strength was there completely. Um, coming back and taking the dub like this, especially after other teams had struggled with COVID all year. Huge win. Just absolutely monster win. And then Rutgers that week, um, a weeknight game on Thursday night. Michigan didn't play its best game of the year. But the outcome really wasn't in doubt for much of the game. Um, the only reason the score was a seven-point game was because Michigan blew a pretty decent second-half lead to make things interesting with around four minutes left. But it wasn't really ever in doubt. And this was kind of when things began clicking again offensively. Um, they hadn't against Wisconsin, really. But against Rutgers, things were clicking a little more. And then the Ohio State game on February 21st, when Michigan was ranked third in the country and Ohio State was ranked fourth in the country, just reinforced both of these teams as national title contenders. Michigan put up 92. Ohio State put up 87. The offenses were flowing. Just shots were falling, both from outside and from inside. Hunter Dickinson ended the game with a really solid performance. He had 15 in, like, 11. Um, EJ Liddell played really well. Dwayne Washington played really well. Uh, Dwayne Washington, I think, had 30 in this one. Um, that was a problem for Michigan throughout the season, du limiting Dwayne Washington. We really struggled with that in both our matchups against Ohio State. But in this one, Michigan's offense was too good uh, all across the board. Shawnee Brown had a big game. Uh, Isaiah Livers played really well. Franz Wagner didn't have his best game of the season, but he rarely did in the big games, uh, as we'll talk about later. Uh, but this was still a great one for Michigan. And then that week, that week, that week, um, sorry about repeating that, but that week, uh, Michigan took on an Iowa team that at the time was ranked fifth in the country and just annihilated, annihilated them. Um, this game was over with about 15 minutes left in the second half, and the lead really stayed around 20 points for the majority of the second half. Uh, Hunter Dickinson just shut down uh, Luca Garza, and the outside shooting was really great from Isaiah Livers, from Eli Brooks, and from Mike Smith. This was Michigan at its peak right here. This game, I... I I remember making a video asking if we were the best team in the country after this one. Because the way we played in this game, if Michigan played like that the rest of the season, UCLA's not beating them in the Elite Eight. Ohio State's not beating them in the Big Ten semifinal. This is a team that doesn't lose another game until maybe Baylor or Gonzaga. So this was the peak of the year, in my opinion, in the way Michigan played. Now, Michigan – oh, and also in this game, Hunter Dickinson was massive on the offensive glass. I forgot to mention that, but I said he helped the team in other ways. He really matured as the year went on in terms of finding crashing the glass, 
playing solid defense. He he got better as he went on in those aspects of the game, even when his shots stopped falling. All right, the Indiana game. Indiana was free falling by this point. They had earlier in the year been considered a tournament team, uh, even though they were a bubble team. They were a tournament team for most of the year, but at this point they were falling quickly. And Michigan didn't play their best basketball, but it didn't matter. This Indiana team was toast. After this win, uh, Kansas lost or Baylor lost on this day as well. So Michigan actually rose to second in the country and second in Ken Palm for their only time ever. This was, if you're thinking about ranking wise, the peak of the season. And of course, February 28th, March 1st, and March 2nd, three days later, on a Tuesday night game on the ESPN Blockbuster, Jay Billis on the call. Michigan put up its worst game of the season. Without IO, Illinois crushed us, just crushed us. And it wasn't that Illinois played amazingly. They played well. But Michigan just wasn't hitting shots. The ball wasn't moving quickly. It wasn't crisp. It was sloppy play from everyone. The defense was non-existent. Uh, lack of effort, which was what I was most concerned by in a big game. We didn't come to play. Only time it happened all year. But it was concerning, to say the least. Moving on from that one, because that was a really crushing loss uh, for me to watch. I, I sat through the entire game. And it was it was brutal to watch, uh, but I had to watch it because Illinois I knew was up there with us in terms of not just the Big Ten race but the national race. I thought after this game, people put Illinois ahead of Michigan in their pecking order. I didn't overreact to this game as much as others did, though. So I, I knew Michigan didn't play up to its potential by any by any stretch of the imagination here, and that I I still think that Michigan pound for pound is a better team than Illinois. Um, Michigan State. Bounce back win. Michigan State played terribly in this one. This clinched the Big Ten title for Michigan, the regular season one, uh, by percentage, which is what matters in the COVID year. I made a video about that too. And it was a really great win because Juwan was happy. The players were happy. They could kind of forget about COVID for a little and just celebrate. They'd been tested all week. Uh, they'd gone through their little COVID break. They'd gone through everything. And they had won the Big Ten title in a year where the Big Ten was considered one of the best team, one of the best leagues of all time. I, I will say the tournament – Hurt that notion a bit, but still, it was a great, great title. Final game of the regular season, Michigan State needed this one to make the NCAA tournament. They got it. They played much harder than Michigan all game. The shots stopped falling. Eli Brooks got injured. Uh, it was a tough one by all by all means. I made a video after it saying it could have been the worst case scenario had Eli Brooks actually been out for the year. Of course, in the first game of the Big Ten tournament, the actual worst case scenario happened. Isaiah Livers exacerbated his stress fracture um, and was out for the season. That 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 moment when he, he didn't play very much in this game, he didn't play at all in the second half, really. I, I should have been asking questions immediately. I wasn't. Uh, I just thought he had a bad game, which he did. He had zero points, but it was because he exacerbated his stress fracture. Uh, Michigan didn't need him in this one. They played well enough to easily take care of Maryland. But that that loss of Isaiah Livers is what ended up losing Michigan really their chances at winning the national title. Uh, I know that that sounds like an excuse, and I'm not trying to make excuses. Michigan still could have easily made the Final Four this season. But losing Isaiah Livers, your senior leader, your overall team leader, arguably your best player, if not second best player, that is too much to lose when the margins are as thin as they are in March. And it was, it was killer. It, it really was. Michigan then went on to fight valiantly against Ohio State without Isaiah Livers. Ohio State was missing Kyle Young, their star power forward, but I thought Michigan had a bigger hole to fill with Isaiah Livers. Michigan started Brandon Johnson for the first time in this game. He put up a good performance. He would play well the rest of the year, but it wasn't enough. Mike Smith had a last chance to beat Ohio State uh, at the end of the game. Michigan ran a weird ISO for Mike Smith instead of trying to get anything going. Uh, inside inside uh, where they could have hit Hunter Dickinson, who was being guarded by Zed Key. That would have been a mismatch. But alas, Mike took a contested fadeaway shot, and it didn't go in, and Ohio State went to the Big Ten title game. Uh, tough loss there. But I wasn't too hung up about it. I still knew Michigan would get the one seed in the tournament, which they did. They drew Texas Southern in the first round. Ugly, ugly game here. Really tough Uh not the Texas Southern, nothing take away from them, but they are not a very good team. They, they just don't have the same capabilities as Michigan. Um, they made the tournament, which is good for them, and they put up a really good fight in the second half. 
but Michigan allowed them to get the game way closer than it should have been. I know it was 16 points, but if Michigan played like this in this game or in this game, they would have lost. Second round, great offensive performance from Eli Brooks and Shondi Brown especially. I made a recap of this one. Not too much to talk about here. Cam Thomas and Javante Smart on LSU went completely bonkers, combined for 57 points. Michigan withstood that one by eight. I was really impressed with this performance. I actually thought it was the best performance Michigan made, Michigan had in the entire NCAA tournament. I thought it was the best performance we had uh, since this Iowa win, actually, uh, offensively at least. Sweet 16, defensive lockdown. A Florida State team that was the biggest in the country, longest, tallest, whatever you're going to say. Michigan ended up winning pretty routinely by 18 points. It was above 20 for a lot of the second half. Shutting down MJ Walker, shutting down any hope Florida State had of winning this game for pretty much from the 15-minute mark of the first half. And going to the Elite Eight where UCLA was waiting for us after beating Alabama in a classic Sweet 16 matchup. Oh, this game, I can't. It's a nightmare for me to even try to recap it. I didn't make a recap video. In my preview, I had Michigan winning by nine points. I really didn't see much, any circumstance where UCLA won this game, which was my mistake. You never count out a team that's in the Elite Eight. And I think Michigan did a little bit of that too, but I just think the shots weren't falling by like no one. I mean, layups, point-blank layups, so many good looks from three, just so many chances that Michigan had in this one to take the win. And shout-out to UCLA. Shout out to Johnny Juzang and Nick Cronin. And Johnny Juzang had 28 in this game, and he is, I think, the breakout star of this tournament. I think people have to agree with me there. Going from on off the radar to a potential lottery pick and just shooting like he was Steph Curry. I mean, couldn't miss. No one could guard him uh, on Michigan. We had Eli Brooks on him. We had Shawnee Brown on him. We had Franz Wagner on him, and it wasn't working. Um, and I will say, Michigan still could have won the game. <laughs> If Franz Wagner hits a shot or if Eli Brooks doesn't panic in the closing seconds and throws up a terrible layup attempt, or if Mike Smith makes a wide-open layup or Hunter Dickinson makes a wide-open layup, or if Michigan doesn't shoot 6 for 11 from the free throw line. So many stats, so many missed opportunities here. Alas, if you had told me before the year that Michigan would make the Elite Eight, I would have taken it right then and there. This team I didn't see as a contender, but they proved themselves to be one of the better teams in Michigan basketball history. I know it ended in the Elite Eight. That's too early. If Isaiah Livers is there, we beat UCLA for sure, and I do think we have a good chance of beating Gonzaga. It didn't happen. Michigan fans will rue the, rue the game against Maryland where Isaiah went down for good, but the Elite Eight is still a good ending, uh, still a good performance in the tournament without him. And, you know, that that's the way college basketball goes. You, you can't expect to make the final four even if you're a one seed and Michigan didn't play like they expected to they just got beaten by a quality opponent an underseed opponent didn't have their best shooting day and it happens it happens it happens to the best teams it happens to everyone and it happened to Michigan on that day what a year what a ride it was really something to behold for me as a Michigan fan it was a lot of fun uh shout out to all the players especially the seniors, Isaiah Livers, most of all, he was such a great player throughout his four-year career at Michigan. Um, Austin Davis, big country as he was called. He was, he was just a beast inside the entire season. He gave us valuable minutes and he worked his butt off every single minute of every game he played in. He had, he was a defensive liability, but he worked, he worked so hard. I would never blame him for anything. Uh, he just had some physical deficiencies that he couldn't make up for with anything. Mike Smith transferred in from Columbia, put up an admirable season where he took care of the ball. He shot great from three. He was just everything you want in a point guard and a smart decision maker and a capable scorer who took the back seat for Michigan's other athletic guys. Chani Brown transferred from Wake Forest, gave Michigan some valuable energy, Every game he played him would pop off all the time. I mean, he finished with a lot of double-digit scoring games, a lot of 15-plus point games where he was Michigan spark when they needed one. And, of course, the non-seniors that might leave, Franz Wagner, sophomore. Franz Wagner 
really ignore the final game of the season, ignore the UCLA game. He played really well this entire season, finishing with 13 points a game, finishing with a solid six rebounds and three assists a game as well. He did well. Great stream. Thank you, Wave, Wavy Boy Dre. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop off now. Um, and also Eli Brooks. Last last mention, Eli Brooks took Michigan to the Elite at this tournament. He was our best player in the NCAA tournament with his awesome games against LSU uh, and in the Big Ten tournament as well. Oh, what a run. Uh, I just spoke everything out. Um, and, yeah, if you liked the video, give me a thumbs up here because this was a long one and a hard one to make after that loss to UCLA. That's all, guys. Uh, thanks for watching. See ya.